Ajahn Patel is a spokesperson for the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade and a longtime activist um, in, in, in global Indigenous networks. He does amazing work, and we are very happy to have him here. Thank you.
because the people who discovered us uh, wanted to dispossess us of our, our land and our territory. And they've been doing that over and over and over again, starting from the East Coast to the West Coast. And BC is one of those kind of unique, unique kind of situations where it never really was settled. You know? That's how come you hear, uh, seen in the media the other day, Robin, giving Robin Mail's story, where Christy Clark is saying that she basically wanted to open up eight new mines here in British Columbia, but she had to sign 10 non-treaty agreements with local First Nations near those mines. What that says is that there is serious economic uncertainty in the province of British Columbia, and, and you're in the middle of it. You're really in the middle of it, of a real crisis that can go either way. Either they're going to be able to force those 10 communities and nations in designing those 10 agreements, because you want to do this by 2015, four years from now. So we're under pressure. Two of those mines are in Solomon territory. The Yellowhead Mine and the Ajax Mine near Camels. Yellowhead Mine's up by Bailey. You know, and where are we, what are, what are we going to talk about? Because there is a fundamental difference, you know, when I go back 500 years, um, and you, there is a very different set of values, and, and, they, and they permeate through economics and through decisions and planning and all this kind of stuff. There's a very difference between indigenous people and settlers. There is a real big difference. Settlers basically have been looking and have been guided by an economic, I guess, plan or strategy or model that's sort of based on um, a hierarchical system where the land is looked at as a resource. <coughs> Forest resource, mineral resource, you know, water resource, you know, but it's a resource and the whole purpose of federal and provincial legislation which determines right now, illegally, but it nevertheless does determine access and benefits to our traditional territories, provide uh, mineral permits or timber permits, not the purpose of sustaining the, the environment, but for sustaining the company that owns the permit or owns the license. You know? And it's motivated by profit Christy Clark needs. That's what she needs these 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 uh, eight new mines. She needs some she needs some money come rolling. It's not just jobs for the unemployed. It's, it's really the province itself needs a revenue base because they screwed up the fishing industry. They screwed up the damn forestry industry. And now they want to get in and screw up the whole earth by messing around with leaving tailings that are going to be you know we're going to have to live with you know forever. So that's the kind of strategy she has, because, and that's the way they look at resources. Native people look at resources quite different, and I don't know if you know Native people yourself personally. I know that uh, there's some Canadians that don't know a Native person at all. <laughs> Out of the skirmish of dispossessing us of our land, we're not a large population. It's only about around really 600,000 of us in registered kind of status, <coughs> a million of us with non status and all that. But, you know, in Canada, I don't know BC, there's a little under 200,000 out of the 4.7 million people that live in BC. So it's, it's quite possible for uh, one of the 4.5 million not to know one of the people that are in the small 200,000 group body. But it's, I think it's important to understand, and I just like to say, like, I'm just going to give you an example. Like in the Haida case, 
the um, logging companies had gotten down to uh, the last 20% of the old growth forest. And there I was sitting in the Supreme Court of Canada listening to the arguments put forward by the Haida Nation to protect that last 20% old growth forest. There was no other non-native people other than, other than the two municipalities. There was no other people arguing there. The Indian people were the last ones that were standing up saying, you know, don't cut it. Don't do it. And they won. And that's how you got this consultation accommodation stuff that, that's come in because <clears throat> the reason I say that is because indigenous people treat the earth as an equal partner. Treat the animals as equal partners. Treat the plants as equal partners. Treat the air and the water as equal partners. And we're in a circle of equality. You know, we don't look at the land as a, as a resource. It's a very different value system. That's how come when Nautilus showed up 500 years ago, there was a lot of sand cod and there's a lot of trees and there's a lot of, you know, those things that we had were for the future. What they want to do with it. We didn't want to just parcel it all off into a nice microphone or a nice plastic glass. You know, sure, we might have discovered, sure, we might have looked kind of poor and pretty, <laughs> pretty raw, but we had a lot of resources. These things that they not many people probably had a lot of that because that was from a different value system. That value system, instead of, it was the value system that made the Haida go broke, fighting <coughs> Warehouser, Mag, Blow, and the Canadian and the BC governments. You know, you have to make sacrifice. You know, they weren't out there trying to say, oh, we want a, a good chunk of the remaining 20%. That was not their position, you know? And that's something that Native people can contribute in terms of reassessing the economics that have sort of taken us over the last 500 years. Because you know, apparently many of you have lost confidence in the corporations, you know, creating <laughs> and providing this uh, um, question of leadership within the free market system to be able to provide to the answer. You know, the whole question of global warming, you know, is making people realize for the first time that we knew all along that if you take carbon from the land of Saudi Arabia and put it in the air, you're going to make the temperature of the planet go up by one degree. See, that's what I'm telling you, that the earth itself does have a life to itself, and if you mess with it, then you're going to cause consequences. But Canadians are stupid. <laughs> because they're going to do the same bloody thing to the tar sands. And the temperature's going to go up another one degree. You know, at least your great-grandparents weren't that stupid, because that was the first time they started messing around. But we're real stupid. You know, the Alberta guys and all that, the economic leaders that we have, the ones that want to put the pipeline through. Those guys are real idiots. And we're letting them get away with it because, you know, I've got guys in Vernon that fly up the, the tar stands. You know? People all from Vancouver fly up there work in those camps. You know? And we're not saying the damn thing about it because it's, it's one of the reasons the Canadian economy is still fairly strong is because of that. But those are serious questions. So I guess I'm saying, you know, up to now, the way the non-natives have been governing, uh, Canada has been through this mutual exclusive jurisdiction that the federal and provincial governments claim under the Canadian Constitution. You know, the thing is, is that uh, when her Majesty the Queen came here. She started, started colonizing this place, and then the Canadians wanted to give her some form of independence. She, she um, uh, I 
guess, uh, established the British North America Act of 1867, which became the Canadian Constitution from 1867 to 1982. And in that Constitution, the collective power of the Canadian people for the, with, for the territorial boundaries of Canada was divided between the mutual and exclusive powers under Section 91 Federal Powers and Section 92 Provincial Powers. And that's basically how all the decisions regarding tar sands, regarding all the stuff that's been done in, in Canada regarding our land and our territory, how those decisions have been made. They haven't been made by indigenous people, they've been made in Ottawa, and they've been made in Victoria. So when you talk about commons, the real commons, according to the constitution of this country, which is the highest law, is governed by parliament and by the provincial legislatures. You really don't have a say in that. The only say that you have is to elect a, a, a member of the legislature, a member of, par or a member of the parliament, and then once you elect them, they're not responsible to you because under responsible government, they're really responsible to the House of Commons. They're not responsible to the constituents that elected them. So when you start talking about Commons, you really don't have a leg to stand on constitutionally in, in that sense. If you want the court, you, you could deem as to having no status at all. The only people that have really been able to challenge that has been us indigenous people under Aboriginal title and rights. You know, way back when the Canadian government, Trudeau, wanted to patriate the Canadian Constitution uh, and bring it back so it becomes the Canada Constitution, one that we have now in 1982. Uh, way back then in 1980, my dad, uh, George Emanuel, was the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And he put together a train called the Constitution Express. It cost him $85,000 to lease this train. And I came across Canada and really raised the awareness of the media and the Canadian people and the indigenous people themselves that we do have an interest in how the Constitution of this country is. And what happened in the end um, after lobbying the subsequent year in 1981 in London, England, one of the House of Lords, House of Commons, and doing all these different things, they forced Canada to include Section 35.1 of the Canadian Constitution, which says that the federal and provincial government is going to, uh, you know, uh, recognize and affirm existing Aboriginal treaty rights. As soon as they did that, they uh, cut back on their 91, 92 powers. Because what is an Aboriginal title and an Aboriginal right? It's things that we can do that we don't need to ask the federal or provincial government to do. And one of them is to hunt, and one of them is to fish. And in 1997, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that Aboriginal title is an Aboriginal right which means we're the only ones that can challenge the federal and provincial government on whether they can make, build a mine, build these mines. So there is a way for Canadians to be able to get into this debate if we work along with indigenous people. But I need to know what the heck you mean when you say commons, and you need to know what the heck I mean when I say Aboriginal title. And if we want to do an end run on the federal and provincial jurisdiction, that's probably one of the strongest ways, because what we need, because there is only about around a couple hundred thousand of us in BC, we need broad-based support amongst non-native people to force the government politically to change the way they've been you know, destroying this, this province. Yeah.